In this video, we'll go over the answer to question 11 to 15 of the 2020 New South Wales HSC chemistry exam. Question 11 states, equal volumes of two 0.04 molar solutions were mixed together. Which pair of solutions would give the greatest mass of precipitate? Then we have four options, A, barium hydroxide and magnesium chloride, B, barium hydroxide and magnesium sulfate, C, barium hydroxide and sodium chloride, or D, barium hydroxide and sodium sulfate. As we see, all options have barium hydroxide solution as one of the two solutions that were mixed. And we know that barium forms insoluble solid with certain anions. In options A and C, we have chloride ions in the other solution mixed in, while in options B and D, we have sulfate ions mixed in. Considering the combinations the barium ions would make with these anions, we know that barium chloride is soluble or barium sulfate is not. How do we know this? Well, we can look at the table of solubility constants found at the back of the exam. This provides a list of salts that range from slightly insoluble to very insoluble based on their KSP or solubility product values. Barium sulfate has a very low KSP value and therefore forms a precipitate, while barium chloride is not found on this list at all. Therefore, it can be considered soluble. However, if we consider options B and D now, the mass of barium sulfate produced would be the same in each option. This is based on what the question states at the start. That is, the solutions have the same concentration and volume and therefore number of moles. Plus, the ratio of barium to sulfate is the same in both B and D. So how do we choose between options B or D? At this point, we look at the other ions and realize that another precipitate can form. In option B, the magnesium ions from the sulfate interact with the hydroxide ions from the barium solution. While in option D, the sodium ions from the chloride interact with the hydroxide ions from the barium solution. Like all sodium salts, sodium hydroxide is completely soluble. However, the magnesium hydroxide is insoluble, as we can see on the solubility table. Coming back, we know that magnesium hydroxide is insoluble, and therefore, another precipitate forms in option B. As the only option with two precipitates, the mass of precipitate is maximized, and option B is the answer. We won't go through it here, but instead of looking at the barium ion combinations first, we could have considered the hydroxide ion combinations first and eliminated options based on hydroxide solubilities before moving to the barium ion combinations. Either way, we would have found that option B was the answer. Moving on, question 12 states, the structure of a part of a polymer chain is shown. This is followed by a structural diagram of the repeating unit in a polymer. The question then is, which statement best explains why plastics made from this polymer require a temperature of approximately 250 degrees Celsius before they begin to soften. This is followed by the options, the carbon-carbon bonds in the polymer chains are strong, the carbon-hydrogen bonds in the polymer chain are strong, extensive dipole-dipole and dispersion forces exist between the polymer chains, or extensive hydrogen bonds and dispersion forces exist between the polymer chains. Firstly, as the question refers to the softening of the polymer with increasing temperature, this means we are dealing with the physical properties of the polymer. The polymer itself remains intact, but the connections between molecules in the material weaken to allow movement and the softening of the material. This is because the physical properties of a polymer and other molecules is determined by the intermolecular forces rather than the intramolecular bonds or covalent bonds. Therefore, we can eliminate options A and B, as these refer to the bonds between atoms rather than the forces between molecules. Now, we just need to determine which option accurately represents the forces between the molecules in options C and D. Both talk of dispersion forces, so it is really up to determining if dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonds are present between these polymer molecules. Remember that dipole-dipole forces occur when a dipole is set up between atoms of highly different electronegativities that are not cancelled out by the overall structure of the molecule. These would be formed, for example, in these C double bonded O's on either side of the benzene ring. The more electronegative oxygen attracts electrons more readily, causing the oxygens to have a small overall negative charge on the oxygen, and as a result, a small positive charge on the carbon. Therefore, we would get dipole-dipole forces between two molecules of this polymer, as we see here. However, the important note is that there are no covalent bonds between a hydrogen atom and either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. This means there are no very strong dipoles formed, and therefore hydrogen bonds between molecules of this polymer do not occur. This eliminates option D, leaving option C as the answer. In the next question, question 13 asks, which of the following conversions results in the formula of a different shape around the carbon atom? 
This is followed by four options. Methanoic acid to methanol, methanoic acid to methanol, methanoic acid to methanoamide, or methanoic acid to sodium methanoate. So, we are looking for when the product is a different shape to the reactant. The first thing we note is that all options start with methanoic acid. This is always the starting compound, so we need to consider the shape around this carbon atom. The shape of methanoic acid is trigonal planar. Now, you either have to remember this, or to make things a bit easier, you can apply the VSEPR theory for molecular shape, otherwise known as the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. This can help you determine the shape of a molecule or part of a molecule by considering valence electron pairs around the central atom. As stated in Blackman et al, electron pairs around an inner atom within a molecule will be situated as far apart as possible in the preferred three-dimensional structure. If we look at methanoic acid, we can see the valence electron pairs are divided into three main sets, a CH bond, a COH bond, and the double bonded CO bond. This nice table from Blackman et al outlines the shape expected from a molecule with different sets of electron pairs around the central atom. We see that in this case of three sets of electron pairs, we will get a trigonal planar structure, or basically a flat structure with three spokes. So we can draw out the product of options A through D and keep in mind that if there are three sets of electron pairs around the carbon atom, then the shape will remain the same, trigonal planar, and that will not be the answer we're looking for. We want to find the molecule with a different shape. So starting with methanol from option A, that is the conversion to the aldehyde, we can see that the structural formula is very similar, and importantly, we have three sets of electron pairs around the carbon atom. Therefore, the shape remains trigonal planar. This eliminates option A. In option B, we have the conversion to the alcohol, methanol, and the structural formula of this shows that we no longer have three sets of electron pairs around the carbon. Instead, we have four sets. This means that we would have a tetrahedral shape instead. Therefore, option B is the answer we are looking for. However, we can eliminate the other options as well, just to be sure. In option C, we have methanoamide, replacing the OH with NH2, as seen in the structural formula. Yet again, we only have three electron pair sets around the carbon, and the shape will be trigonal planar, eliminating option C. Lastly, the conversion of the acid to the methanoate ion will produce an ion with the following structure. This is almost the same as our methanoic acid, except a proton has been lost off the OH group. Therefore, we still have three sets of electron pairs around the carbon, and the structure remains trigonal planar in shape. This eliminates option D and leaves only option B as our answer. Going to the next question, question 14 states, the equation for the order ionization of water is shown. This is followed by a reversible equation between water and its ions. And then the statement, at 50 degrees Celsius, the water ionization constant, Kw, is 5.5 times 10 to the negative 14. The question then is, what is the pH of water at 50 degrees Celsius? Then options A through D are 5.50, 6.63, 6.93, and 7.00 respectively. The first thing we can do is write down all the information we can gather from the question, and then try to determine any calculation we can do to find the answer. Firstly, the water ionization constant, as with all equilibrium constants, can be summarized in the general expression of K is equal to the concentration of the products, all multiplied by each other, divided by the concentration of the reactants, all multiplied by each other. An important note is that each reactant and product is raised to the power of the appropriate stoichiometric coefficient. So, in the case of the order ionization of water, it would look something like this. However, as H2O is a liquid, it is not considered in the equilibrium constant. Its concentration would effectively be 1. Therefore, it would just be the concentration of the hydronium ion and hydroxide ion multiplied by each other. Using the value for the constant at 50 degrees given in the question, we know that multiplying the concentration of the hydronium and hydroxide ions will give us 5.5 times 10 to the negative 14. However, as indicated in the chemical equation in the question, the order ionization of water produces equal numbers of hydronium and hydroxide ions, and therefore equal concentrations as well. This means we can make a substitution and let X equal to the concentration of the hydronium ions, which as we stated is also the concentration of the hydroxide ions thereby allowing us to substitute x into our equation and then solve for x. This gives x equal to 2.345 times 10 to the negative 7. Looking at the formulas at the back of the exam, we know that the pH is calculated by taking the negative log base 10 of the hydrogen or hydronium ion 
concentration. Therefore, as this is just x in our substitution, that means the pH is equal to the negative log base 10 of 2.345 times 10 to the negative 7. Plugging this in our calculator, we get the pH as 6.63 and therefore the answer is option B. The last question in this video is question 15. Question 15 states the structure of chloracetamide is shown. This is followed by the structural formula for the compound and then the following. The common isotopes of chlorine are 35Cl and 37Cl. The mass spectrum of chloracetamide contains a peak at m slash z or mass to charge ratio equal to 51. What is the most likely source of this peak? We are then given four options. Option A, OCl with no charge. Option B, the NH2 plus ion. Option C, the C4H3 plus ion. And option D, the CH2Cl plus ion. So basically in this question, we need to match up one of these species to the information given in the question. There are a number of ways to eliminate options and find the final answer, but we will go through anything that doesn't require calculations first and save adding up the atomic masses of each species until the point we absolutely have to. Something you may also want to do to save time in an exam setting. Of course, the main piece of information here is the mass to charge ratio of 51. However, the important point is that it comes from a mass spectrometer. As we talked about in question one of this exam, a mass spectrometer is able to help identify chemical species by first electrically charging a sample. This is so that particles produced from this can then be deflected by a magnetic field and separated based on mass. The key here being that the particle is electrically charged. See question one again for a diagram and brief description of the process. With this, we can eliminate option A as it is not electrically charged at all and therefore would not be detectable in a mass spectrometer. Next, when the sample is passed through a mass spectrometer, we know that not all the charged particles at the end will be of the entire molecule itself, otherwise known as the molecular ion. In fact, the molecular ion can break up in the process and produce other daughter ions. However, these daughter pieces will still be fragments from the original molecule. Looking at the remaining options, we say that option B is a possible daughter ion made from the NH2 off the right side of the molecule. Option D is also another possible daughter ion made from the left side of the molecule effectively the main carbon chain without the oxygen. Importantly, the carbon chain is only two carbons long, and therefore we would not be seeing a four carbon chain long daughter ion as implied by option C. Therefore, we can eliminate option C as well. At this point, we can now determine the atomic mass of the two options we have left. And although it may be clear what the answer is, we can just verify that we have the right answer. In option B, with a nitrogen and two hydrogens, we would have a total mass to charge ratio of 16 much lower than the 51 we need. This eliminates option B, and although we know it must be option D, we can verify the mass of that ion. With a carbon, two hydrogens, and a chlorine, we would have a mass to charge ratio of 49 or 51, depending on the chlorine isotope. This fits with the 51 we are looking for, and means option D is our answer. If we had started with determining the mass of each option first, we can see that options A and C would also have fit the mass to charge ratio of 51, and if we had done it this way, we would have eliminated only one option, option B to begin with. That concludes this video. Please tune in for the next set of videos from this exam. Thanks for watching and see you next time.